Good morning and welcome to Audubon Park Church. It's my joy to welcome you to this service of worship. I come to you today from the sanctuary of Audubon Park Church. And I know that many of you are tuned in from around the community and even around the country. It's such a gift that we can come and gather in worship, not coming physically to this space, but bound together by the power of the Spirit when we can't physically be present with one another. Today is a great day for worship, but it's also a milestone day, one that I had hoped we'd never observe together. This is our 52nd week of online-only worship. We've gone 52 weeks, an entire year, without gathering in our sanctuary, without seeing each other in person, without raising our voices together in prayer, or in song. And while I think we've done a fairly good job of staying connected to each other during this unthinkable year, it's still a whole year of separation and grief that we hold. This month, we also mark 500,000 COVID-related deaths in the United States, half a million lives lost because of this virus. And so while we begin today's worship with trust that God is present, and hope that God is yet working, and gratitude for everyone who has held us together throughout this year, we also, this uh, morning during our time of worship, will have a, a time of lament. We invite you to have a candle ready for our prayer time later in the service, and, and we will invite you to light that candle later this morning in, our, in, in observance of these 52 weeks and these 500 lives, and the many losses and griefs and hardships of the pandemic. As we worship together this morning, we'd love to know that you're worshiping with us, and so we invite you to fill out an online connection card. You can find that uh, on our website, or you can also just drop a comment in the comment section so that we uh, know you're worshiping with us today. If you do that, we'll say hi. We'd love for you to say hi back and connect with your friends uh, via that chat. We also uh, encourage you to share your prayer requests with us. You can do that using the online connection card or the chat on Facebook and YouTube. We'd love to know how we can be praying for you this week. Today we continue our series of sermons that we're calling A Bigger Table. This is our Lenten series as we prepare our hearts and our minds for Holy Week and Easter, we're exploring uh, a series of stories in the Gospel of Luke that all center around a meal. Meals in the Gospel of Luke are occasions for revelation from Jesus, for important lessons, uh, for important actions by Jesus. And so we're exploring these stories to learn more about Jesus and more about uh, his call on our lives. Well, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. Um, I'm going to invite Sydney up to lead us in our call to worship. Good morning. My name is Sydney, and I'll be leading the call to worship this morning. God calls to the lost, the least, and all who long for home. God calls when we wander from the path chosen for us and waste the gifts that we have been given. God calls and welcomes, welcomes us back to worship this day. Let us celebrate and rejoice in God's presence forever. Let us worship together. Let us pray. Holy God, your power fills the universe with light and love. Your tender hand caresses those who are suffering and wounded. You, are welcomed, you welcome strangers and care for the lonely. We are awed by the amazing extent of your compassion. Meet us where we are. Speak to us in ways that we understand. Come to us, O God, in our time of worship. Still our hearts and minds, renew our spirits, and fill us with the life that only you can offer. I lay my burdens at your feet I'm letting go of all the things I can't control In my frailty, Lord, I find your strength I'm depending on a love that won't let go 
So I trust you, I trust you, I trust you, oh, you are my peace. Yes, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you, oh, you are my peace.
morning and, and blessings uh, once more from Carol's and my uh, home to you and yours. Uh, Pastor Jeff was reminding me uh, uh, earlier in the week that this Sunday marks the, uh, the first anniversary of our COVID shutdown. You, you remember that shutdown that we thought was going to last about six weeks or maybe a, <clears throat> a couple of months at most. And now we are at the one-year mark. Um, n- no doubt so, some, some good things and some good ministry has come out of this time, but there's also, there are also those things that we lament the loss of. And uh, I wanted to take time, or uh, Jeff and I wanted to give the opportunity uh, for uh, us together as a congregation to l- lament uh, the losses of, of this past year, uh, the things we've missed and missed out on as, as a people. Um, uh, several folks will be uh, sharing their, uh, their words of lament, and then I'll be closing us with a, a word of hope as we, as we look forward. Um, staff members uh, Cole Peterson and Laura Valanza, Drew Homechick, uh, we, will, we will be hearing from as, <coughs> as they light their candles of lament. Uh, uh, ministry uh, leaders in our congregation, uh, uh, Olga Trunz, our lay, lay leader, uh, uh, food bank coordinator, Karen Peterson, Stephen Ministry uh, uh, coordinator, Barbara White. And then I also ask the Lyle family. Uh, from a, uh, They are a, a newer uh, young family in our congregation, and we're just kind of uh, getting anchored in when this COVID time uh, has come upon us. And I invited them to to share a, a, a lament uh, as well. So we'll uh, offer this time, and let me uh, begin it with a, a familiar reading. Uh, Pastor Jeff led us through a, a, a sermon series on uh, the whole subject of disruption. And he talked a lot about how that had affected the people, Israel. And uh, this psalm grows out of one of their primary periods of disruption. Psalm 137, just selected verses. By the rivers of Babylon, and as you recall, they were literally drug off uh, by the Babylonians uh, to this place where they did not want to be. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and, and wept when we remembered Zion. And in this very vivid image, uh, <clears throat> on the willows there, we, we hung our lyres. Uh, for our captors required of us songs in our tormentors' mirth, saying, uh, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And then this, this well-known response, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Uh, that's what we've been doing this past year. We've been learning how, as a people, to continue to sing the Lord's song, to be the Lord's people, uh, 
during a strange time, this period of a strange land. And now we will uh, hear from various of our uh, leaders and members about how this time has affected them. And I would invite you to scurry about and uh, see if you can come up with a candle quickly. There'll be time at the end for you to have an opportunity to light your, your candle of lament at home as well. And, and so, uh, if possible, have one handy. May God hear our prayers as we offer this time of remembrance and lament. A definition of lamentations is sorrow, mourning, or regret. We have all mourned the loss of physical contact with friends and family and the loss of freedoms to come and go without wearing a mask or keeping social distancing. These have been a major adjustment for many of us. Air hugs are no substitute for the real thing. Our Stephen ministers have had to adjust to these changing times. Instead of meeting in person and having the benefit and blessing of seeing body language, they have often had to meet by phone. Meeting virtually, although one can see the body language, is still not the same as meeting in person. It can be even more painful for someone who is grieving and can't receive the comfort of a hug, a touch, or the additional presence of a caring person. And the person's family and friends desperately want to be there for them, but they may feel helpless and unsure of what they can do when they can't actually be there. Along with many of you, our Stephen ministers are mourning the loss of what used to be normal. But Stephen ministers continue to make a difference by providing care, compassion, community, and a listening ear. Today, I lament the fact that we haven't sung together in a whole year. Dear God, we grieve for the loss of personal connection, for unmasked smiles, handshakes and hugs, for conversations, laughter and tears, for a building full of friends that connected our souls, enriched our lives and sustained us through the week.
Dear Lord, during these difficult times, we come to you with open arms, raising up a prayer of lament. Our youth ministry program has been affected in so many ways. Less opportunities to meet in person, to gather in fellowship, to reach out to those in need in our communities, to interact with one another, and just to remember what it's like to be a kid. Lord, we pray for a sense of normalcy, a resolution to COVID, and for youth all around the world who have been affected by this terrible disease. Amen. The food ministry program here at Audubon is very sad that we have, are not serving our morning breakfast program and that we are not serving 30 of the families that we once did. Hi, Audubon Park. I can't believe it's been a year since we were all able to worship in person. Um, I remember that Sunday quite vividly. I was interning at Rockwood Retirement for my field education site and seminary, and um, it was the first service we had to turn folks to go home to be safely to quarantine. And it's been sad, and a week turned into a month, turned into a season, turned into a year. But I give thanks for the times that we have been able to connect together, for Bible studies, for Sunday school Zooms. Um, I give thanks for all of you, and I give thanks for the day we can come back together and be together safely and um, share hugs with folks that want to hug and share snacks with folks that want some sugar. Uh, I miss all of you guys, and I miss worshiping together, and I miss hearing your voices and um, I love you all and stay safe. A term that we have, uh, we are hearing uh, very frequently in these days is the term new normal. Uh, we, none of us know exactly what our new normal will look like uh, uh, in, in society and certainly uh, in our church life. Uh, there are things that uh, folks, folks have shared with me that uh, have grown out of this COVID time that you won't be anxious to, to give up. Uh, I've, I've had people say, gosh, how nice to be able to still attend worship on a, on a day when it's uh, maybe difficult to drive uh, in or, or a day when uh, I'm not feeling particularly well and yet, yet I can still still make that connection so uh, and some people have uh, expressed that they've really enjoyed having uh, uh, study opportunities online so that they can connect from home uh, takes a great deal less time maybe people who are working can do it uh, over their lunch hours are oh, we, we will have a new normal our life will never look uh, exactly like it did before. And I believe that that is, is a hopeful thing. Let me conclude our time with uh, just lifting, lifting a word from another familiar song, psalm, this, the, the 98th. Oh, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. <laughs> that's the work that's uh, uh, before us, isn't it? O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, and break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Uh, sing praises to the Lord with lyre, with lyre and the sound of melody. And, and remember uh, the previous psalm where uh, the uh, Jewish community hung hung up their instruments on, on a willow. And now the call is to find ways of allowing those instruments to speak. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise. 
before the Lord our God. We will, we will be living into a, a, a new normal in the days ahead. And there will, be, there will be things that we would never have thought of or, or experimented with had, uh, had we not passed through this time. Now, I'm not saying that, that that's a good reason for having passed through this time. We lament the losses. We look forward to how God will weave together these new pieces in a new way. And so I conclude our prayer time by lighting a candle of, of hope and expectation for us all. God bless you. Amen. I will now be reading Luke 10, chapters 38 through 42. Now, as they went on the way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken from her. When I went off to college, one of the saints of my home church gifted me a peculiar little book titled Practicing the Presence of God. I'll admit to you now that as a freshman in college, I really didn't pay that much attention to it, but I grew to be increasingly grateful for its insight over the years, especially as I began to feel the call to ministry. It became one of the more important resources for me as I explored that call. I hadn't thought about that book in a long time, and then I ran across it again while reading an article on our text for today. The author of this little book argues that God is in his kitchen. The author's name is Brother Lawrence, a lay brother in a French monastery where he participated in the daily rhythm of prayer, seven periods during the day, a total of three hours of prayer every day. And Brother Lawrence found this difficult. Furthermore, he didn't seem particularly close to God while he was praying with eyes shut in a liturgy in the chapel. Brother Lawrence said he could more authentically praise God, pray to God, practice the presence of God in the kitchen when he worked preparing the meals for the monastery. The monks, he wrote, were particularly fond of his pancakes. It was while working with his pots and pans that Brother Lawrence prayed and knew the presence of God. And the little book composed of his notes and reflections published after he died is a classic in the literature of spirituality. I thought about him this week when reading a little story in the Bible about a woman who was working in her kitchen while Jesus was in the living room talking with her sister. It's a favorite and familiar story. This morning we continue a series of sermons that we're calling A Bigger Table, a series focused on seven stories from the Gospel of Luke that all center around a meal. In Luke's gospel, meals are occasions for Jesus to reveal something important or teach something important. And so we're exploring these stories to learn more about Jesus and our walk with Christ as we prepare for Holy Week and Easter. And this week, we explore the story of Mary and Martha. Now, Luke's story of Mary and Martha is almost guaranteed to stir up an argument. Uh, to begin with, there's already an argument going on in this story. And over the years, there have been countless more arguments generated about this story. So here's what happened to cause the argument in the story. As Luke tells it, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And one day he stops in a certain village where two sisters live, Mary and Martha. Martha takes the initiative, welcomes Jesus into her home, 
and begins preparing for him as fancy a meal as she can. There's nothing unusual about this, showing hospitality, welcoming guests, feeding them well. These were very important virtues in that culture, and and Martha is doing her best to show hospitality to Jesus and to make him feel at home. But while she is busily working away on the food, her sister Mary does something unusual. Normally in the ancient world, all of the adult women would have shared in the responsibility for preparing a meal. But Mary chooses not to help out. Instead, she sits quietly at Jesus' feet like a student or a disciple would and listens intently to what Jesus is saying. Well, finally, Martha has had all that she can stand, and here is where the argument starts. (laughs) She's frankly tired of doing all the work while Mary sits, and she lets her feelings be known. Now, we might not have expected her to hiss at Mary, though through clenched teeth, hey, sis, I could use a hand with this, you know. But she doesn't say anything at all to Mary. She instead softly reprimands Jesus and tries to, him to get, tries to get him to tell Mary to get to work. Lord, don't you care, she protests. Don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. So Jesus is in the middle of an argument between sisters. Mary is sitting at his feet listening to him while an irritated Martha, wet bread dough on her hands, is politely telling him off. That he is uncaring and that if he has any sense of what is right, he'll order Mary to get up off the floor and get busy preparing the lamb and the rice. What should Jesus do? Should he defend himself? Should he reassure Martha that he does in fact care? Should he recognize that Martha has a good point? Or maybe he should pull a Jesus-like surprise and get up and prepare the meal himself and let Martha take a rest. Or should he play the role of a peacemaker and say, now Martha, Mary, let's cool this off. We can work this out. What should Jesus do? What he does, and, and this is what has bothered a lot of people down through the years and set off all the arguments about this story, what Jesus does is to gently scold Martha right back and then, apparently, take Mary's side in the dispute. Martha, Martha, Jesus says, you are worried and distracted by many things, but there is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen it. Mary has chosen the better part. Now, if we are going to understand what the story is saying to us today, we have to grapple with this troublesome response by Jesus. Why does Jesus praise Mary over and against hardworking, worn-out Martha? Why does he say that Mary, who simply sits and listens, has chosen a better part than Martha, who is sweating away, preparing a meal, and trying to provide some hospitality? Some people wonder if the Gospel writer Luke has a hidden and not-so-healthy agenda in the way he tells the story. Some people suspect that Luke's real agenda is that he is frankly bothered by women trying to exercise too much leadership in the early Christian community. And so he tells this story in which Jesus criticizes Martha, who is active and doing and working and in charge, and he praises Mary, who is passive and silent. What Luke is trying to do, these folks charge, is put women back in their quiet and obedient places. But I'm sorry to say, this view doesn't really hold any water. Not only does it not square with Jesus' view of women, it doesn't even square with the rest of Luke's gospel either. Throughout Luke, women are not passive and silent. They are prominent and powerful, worthy, articulate, and celebrated. It is Luke, after all, who tells us Jesus' parable about a poor widow who was so vigorous and aggressive in her demands for justice that she caused a powerful and haughty male judge to cave in. No, this is not a story about resisting women's leadership. In fact, Mary, who sits at Jesus' feet in this story, is is actually pictured in the posture of a disciple, an important role normally reserved in that day only for men. So back to the question. Why then does Jesus praise Mary and defend her against Martha? Other people argue that what Jesus is doing is 
criticizing what we might call busy work Christianity. They think that Martha is so preoccupied with her little trivial chores, cooking all those dishes, that she's missed the deeper spiritual point. She is, they say, like so many religious people who spend all their time organizing the stewardship drive or baking pies for the church picnic or going to committee meetings or gathering clothing for the church clothes closet. Busy, busy, busy. But who lack a profound devotional life. In their view, Jesus says to Martha, stop being so busily religious and start being more spiritual like Mary. Well, I do understand that point. And I do hear a lot of people you know, say things like, I'm not into organized religion. I don't really believe in institutional Christianity. That's just playing church. I'm spiritual, but not religious. But I'm sorry that, to say that doesn't hold any water either. The institutional church can be corrupt, that's true, but this doesn't take away from the fact that, that our Christian faith is never an abstract disembodied, purely spiritualized thing. It is always active. It, it always takes on a solid, embodied, active form. After all, God did not write a dreamy valentine in the clouds. Hello, world, I love you. No, God's love came in the fleshly form of Jesus who dwelled among us and got involved in the messy details of everyday life, who taught and healed and touched and ate and gathered and died and rose in bodied form. The incarnation means that the place to find God is not in otherworldly thoughts, but in the earthly details. Mary was not being hospitable in the abstract, and her cooking that meal that day was not trivial. Hospitality really means that somebody has to boil the water and slice the onions. What does it mean for a parent to love a child, for example. It's more than just a feeling or a sentiment. Loving a child means teaching him or her to tie their sneakers and gently wiping dried noses, <laughs> wiping the blood away from the hurt places, and going in the middle of the night when they have a nightmare, driving them to soccer practice, grilling the hot dogs that they have asked for, and helping them with their math homework. <laughs> Or again, I think about the church school teachers, Sunday school teachers, who arrive at the church early every Sunday morning when we do such things so that they can set out you know, all of the supplies, the construction paper, the glue, the scissors for the morning's class. I think about the folks who come down to our food bank every week, come often two, three days a week to prepare for our distributions to those in our community. Think about the many Christians who, who spend their Saturdays hammering nails and installing sheetrock on Habitat for Humanity houses. Busy work? I don't think so. This is the form that love and faith take. I cannot imagine Jesus saying to Christians who are emptying bedpans in AIDS clinics or baking cornbread for the soup kitchen, you people are preoccupied with busy work. Leave the children, the needy, the ill, the lonely behind. Come sit and meditate for a while. Be spiritual, but not religious. This is the better part. Now, some people might say that I'm just making this way too difficult. And they point out that this Mary Martha story comes in Luke immediately after the parable of the Good Samaritan. They argue that Luke is just trying to illustrate the theme that we should love God with all our hearts and our neighbors as ourselves. The parable of the Good Samaritan illustrates love of neighbor. That's what the Samaritan did for the woman beaten by the robbers. And the story of Mary and Martha illustrates love of God. That's what Mary is doing, sitting at Jesus' feet. So, Good Samaritan, love of neighbor, Mary and Martha, love of God. Simple. The problem with this is that you cannot so neatly separate the two. You can't say over here is the love of neighbor and over here is the love of God. In the Christian life, they're, they're intertwined, they're mixed together. You can hardly tell where one ends and the other begins. We show our love of God by loving our neighbor, and the true love of neighbor grows out of our love of God. They're two sides of the same coin. As theologian and preacher Fred Craddock writes, if we were to ask Jesus, which example applies to us, the story of the Samaritan or the example of Mary, his answer would probably be yes. 
And that, I think, may get us close to the real heart of this Mary and Martha story. There's nothing wrong in and of itself with Mary, Mary, Martha fixing all the food and being busy doing work. This is the way people show love and welcome and care, hospitality. There's nothing wrong, in fact. There is something absolutely essential about showing one's love of God and neighbor by baking the bread and washing the olives, by putting out the bottles of glue for Sunday school and nailing those boards for Habitat Humanity and, and making pancakes for Tuesday breakfast. Martha preparing that meal of hospitality is doing a good thing, a necessary thing, an act of service. But if we try to do this kind of service apart from the life-giving word of the gospel, apart from the vision that only comes from God, it will distract us and finally wear us down. Mary has chosen to listen to the word. Jesus, the living word, is present right in her house and if she is going to love God and love neighbor, if she's going to show hospitality to the stranger and care for the lost, then everything depends on hearing and trusting that word, on spending time with Jesus. What did Mary hear at Jesus' feet? She heard parables like the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son. What is the word that we hear from Jesus? Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. What we hear from Jesus is that our lives are gathered into God's life, that God is out there in the world healing and feeding and restoring, and therefore uh, what we do for others counts, really counts. And we can trust God and hope for God's new creation found a story this week about a church youth group on a mission trip to Jamaica. On their trip, they visited one of the local elementary schools, and they spent some time observing in a classroom seriously overcrowded with children, most of them very poor, all of them needy and wiggly and noisy and unruly. It was a difficult, sometimes even chaotic learning environment, but the youth group marveled to see that the teacher carried herself with great calm and patience treating all of the children with love and respect despite the poverty and the chaos. They decided that the only way she could do this was that, that she must really love being a teacher. But they were surprised to hear her say, oh, I don't come here every day mainly because I love teaching. I come here every day because I love Jesus and I see Jesus in every one of these children. I think that teacher had been like Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. And because she had, she could get up like Martha and teach those children with joy and hope, seeing Jesus in the face of every one of them. In her book, An Altar in the World, Barbara Brown Taylor also remembers Brother Lawrence praising God while peeling potatoes and making pancakes. And Taylor surprised her many readers by confessing that she considers herself a failure at con conventional prayer. When people ask me about my prayer life, I feel like a bulimic must feel when people ask her about her favorite dish. She learned in seminary, as we all learned, that there are seven kinds of prayer, adoration, praise, thanksgiving, intercession, petition, penitence, oblation. She came, however, to refer to a new type of prayer that she heard about from a friend, a Benedictine monk. The heart of prayer, Brother David said, is wake up. Prayer is waking up to God. Taylor writes, When I am fully alert to whatever or whoever is right in front of me, when I am electrically aware of the tremendous gift of being alive, when I am able to give myself wholly to the moment I am in, then I am in prayer. Martha, in the kitchen, as well as Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, these are places where God is present and where prayer can happen. Ironically, it was Martha's work, her incessant activity that distracted her. Her good and necessary and God-filled work was actually interfering. Work can do that. We have a hard time not working. I serve on a board with a good friend and we sometimes get distracted by texting during the entire meeting. It is frequently observed that no one is on her when on her deathbed or his deathbed has been heard to say, 
I wish I had spent more evenings and weekends at the office. And how many times do we let work get in the way of our friendships or our relationships with family? I know I regret so much the times I've missed a concert or a recital or a game for a meeting I thought I had to be at. Never turns out to be the case, by the way. Or I think about how many times we try to do two or three things at once. (laughs) You know, at one point while working on this sermon, I was also answering an email and watching a lecture on the intersection of race, Christian faith, and biblical interpretation. (laughs) I eventually realized that I wasn't doing any of these three things well, and I was so consumed with everything that I had going on that I didn't even notice my daughter come into the room until she was right next to me. It was shocking. When I try to do too much, I stop paying full attention to what's going on. And that's what Jesus caught Martha doing, trying to do too much. You can find God wherever you are and whatever you are doing, but sometimes your commitment to what you are doing can distract you from something more important. So wake up to God. Practice the presence of God and pray, pay attention to what is priceless and precious and often right in front of you. And don't ever allow your work to distract you from love, from the people you love and who, lo- who love you and, and need you. Because their love is one of the ways that God comes near and touches you and opens your heart and saves your soul. Let us pray together. You have taught us, O God, that the way to life is to love you with all our heart and to love our neighbor as ourselves. But we are often so overwhelmed by the swirling demands of life that we cannot truly do either one. But then in your mercy there is Jesus. Come to visit in our home, come to speak to us in the midst of life. Let us, like Mary, sit at his feet and listen to his word that gives life. And then having heard that word, let us, like Martha, get up to serve others in Jesus' name. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer We often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful Who will all our sorrow share Jesus knows our every weakness Take it to the Lord in prayer Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with the load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. 
friends despise forsake you take it to the Lord in prayer in his arms he'll take and shield you you will find a solace there in his arms he'll take and shield you you will find a solace there I invite you now to join me in this liturgy as we prepare for the sacrament of communion. Come, all you who are loved by God. Come to the table of the Lord. We come to eat, to drink, and our hearts are glad. Our hearts truly are glad and we are filled with thankfulness because in your great love you did not abandon us in the dark and fearful places of this world. But in Jesus, you came to us to rescue us, to restore us, and to give us new life. All who are tired and burdened, all who are frightened and unsafe, all who are sick and broken can come and find new life. We remember the way that Jesus showed his love for us. On the evening before he died, he had supper with his friends. And during the meal, he took the loaf, he gave thanks and he broke it, and he passed it around with these words. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the meal, he took the cup of wine. He gave thanks for it and then passed it around with these words. This is my blood shed for you. Drink this and remember me. And now every time we eat bread like this, and every time we drink from the cup like this, we remember Jesus and his everlasting love. Let us pray. Come now, Holy Spirit of God, as you were present at creation, be present now, and transform these gifts of bread and cup into the sustaining body and blood of Christ. As you were sent by Jesus to be with us on our journey of faith, be present now and transform us, we who share this meal, into one body in Christ. Amen. And so I invite you now to take the communion elements you may have prepared at home, take the bread, dip it in the cup, and then partake. Let us pray this prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious and loving God, you have made us one in the body of Christ and nourished us at your table with holy food and drink. Thank you for feeding our hunger and relieving our thirst. Now send us into the world to do the work you have given us to do, to find the lost and lonely, to heal broken souls, to free prisoners, and make the powerful care. Grant us strength to persevere in resisting evil to proclaim in all we say and do your good news in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. We do hope you'll uh, join us for virtual coffee hour after the service. Uh, the link will be in the comment section during the next song. Uh, it's also available on the website and in the weekly email. I also hope you'll consider giving generously to our 40 Days of Giving campaign. In this campaign, we're gathering items and funds to support ministries of our church and our community uh, that help those in need and make a difference. And so please consider giving generously to that uh, campaign so that we as a church can make a difference in these difficult times. Let us go with this benediction. May the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. Go in peace and have a blessed week. Come now, fountain of every place.
So 